Whoa. Okay, we're going to start this show. I'm so happy you all are here. And we're going to, I told the people who were here a couple minutes ago, we're going to do this talk on the earthquake shacks that were built after the 1906 earthquake and fire. And then we're going to do a little Q&A where you might have your own questions that David and I will answer whether we know the answer or not, because we're those kind of people. Um, and I have a feeling people will say, is this an earthquake shack? So uh, that's okay. We'll be happy to like chime in or give our opinion on it. But first, hopefully, yeah, go ahead. Hopefully by the end, you'll, you'll have learned enough about earthquake shacks that you will have a good shot at uh, identifying them yourself. I hope so. I think that, you know, that's part of the educational thing we're going to do here is try to give people that feeling. Okay, let's start the show. So happy you're all here. First, just real quick, this is part of a little project I've been doing for almost a year now uh, called San Francisco Story. And uh, it's mostly a weekly email that I share on Wednesdays. Um, so go to SanFranciscoStory.com, sign up for it. It's free to get it. And uh, it's just little history things I like to share and research and and put out to the world. So that's what this is all about. Um, in addition to the weekly email, I have uh, Friends of Woody, which is a paid level. And uh, they joined me for walks. Like this was a nice walk we did in October, something like that. Yeah. The cemeteries around Lone Mountain. And the Friends of Woody also get a my journal that I put out once a year. It's a nice paperback journal. Uh, with all sorts of longer stories, and most importantly, a Friends of Woody membership card. So if you're a friend of Woody and you didn't get a membership card, reach out to me. I will make sure you get one. I believe the artist who created these beautiful cards for me is with us tonight. So maybe she can chime in later and we can all give her a round of applause. Super nice. You like him? I'm number one, but I don't know how many number ones there actually are. Yeah, everybody's a number one on the membership card numbers. <laughs> and I also want to mention, uh, you know, David and I helped start, uh, we, we did start uh, the Western Neighborhoods Project many years ago. And a lot of the photos you're going to see tonight uh, came from the uh, outsidelands.org website, but most came from OpenSF History, which is a project of Western Neighborhoods Project. So if you want to see a lot more photos of earthquake shacks and the earthquake itself, go to opensfhistory.org. Yeah, I'll share a link to the earthquake shack uh, uh, gallery that I made on OpenSF History. That's a great you idea. See a whole bunch of pictures of earthquake shacks all over. That that'd be a great. That that's great. Thank you, David. All right, to start the show. This is what San Francisco is investigating doing today about the unhoused population that the city has. Um, there was a, a pilot program at 33 Gough Street uh, to build 70 little cabins, and uh, they cost $15,000 each, the nonprofit that kind of worked on this. And then they thought it would be another $15,000 for services to help the people in these small cottages and get them off the street and into some kind of housing, even temporarily. The city thought that was a great idea and they were trying, they're trying to do one in the mission um, because it's a city project. Instead of 15,000 each, somehow the price went up to $100,000 each. Um, but I just bring those numbers up because I want you to remember that, that these little, little tiny cottages, little tiny houses for people to, to be housed that are homeless temporarily or uh, long-term, it's about $15,000 or $100,000 in today's dollars. So just remember that when we get to the big project that happened after a real disaster, the 1906 earthquake and fire uh, that happened. Uh, April 18th was the earthquake, and then over three days, fires destroyed a good chunk of the city. Yeah, I mean, something I learned in studying the earthquake, which I really didn't until I looked at thousands of pictures for openness of history, was that, you know, the city didn't just go poof on five o'clock on April 18th, right? I mean, 
it was an unstoppable fire that burned for three days, multiple fires that started in different spots and and destroyed the, the center of town, really. Yeah, and we're going to go through that because this is this is why we, we we're going to be talking about tiny houses tonight. More than 200,000 people were at least temporarily taken out of their houses, either their, their place of where they lived was destroyed or was unlivable for a short time. Um, so we're talking about a giant public disaster um, and how the city tackled that, how they decided <clears throat> to figure out a way to get out of this horrible crisis is, is was very creative for the time. And so just first we talk about the earthquake. So you can see there's so many people that were displaced after the earthquake. And this is what you think of from a movie, right? You got rubble falling, you've got um, floors falling and people just can't live in those, those buildings. Um, I, I'm just gonna show you a couple of photos of things you might recognize. This is the Hibernia Bank, which is still there at McAllister, Jones and Market Streets. It was rebuilt after the earthquake, but you can see the kind of damage. Um, wood frame buildings, if they were on the liquefied land, old creeks or filled land, they often were knocked out of plumb or even collapsed. These kind of pictures are very familiar from the, uh, from the 1989 quake, the Marina District, same mm -hmm. sort of uh, liquefaction on the made land. Yeah. And, you know, even down, this is in the Tenderloin, you can see at Golden Gate Avenue near Hyde, this collapse uh, right on the corner there. Um, and so the first thing that happens, of course, as you can imagine, this happened very early in the morning, is a lot of people thought, wow, let's, let's go do some sightseeing, right? There was a big earthquake. Maybe my house is okay. Let's go check out the damage around town. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, it just like, they kind of shrugged it off and some people even went to work or they tried to go to work after the earthquake figuring that's a big disaster, but right now it's over, but right. it wasn't over. What happened after the earthquake, David? <laughs> a, a whole bunch of fires started in various places. I think one of the first fire started down in what's now the financial district, right? And that's what we're seeing here. Pretty early shot by uh, Willard Warden uh, looking straight up Market Street. Obviously, I mean, framing the ferry building at the end of the street, but both sides just filled. But this one, yeah, the next one is one that really speaks to what you said. I mean, here's this disaster. The front of the building has fallen down on O'Farrell Street right there looks like a dollhouse almost. That's a call building in the background now called the Central Tower at 3rd and Market. But, you know, everybody just got dressed. Ladies put on their hats. They walked down. <laughs> the streetcar, the cable cars were out of commission. They couldn't run. Um, but people just walked down to, to see what happened. Yeah. And uh, they, were, they were greeted with this towers of smoke and Blame. Yeah. A lot of like, you know, down south of market, there was a very industrial zone and there were warehouses and factories and a lot of blazes uh, started along Mission and south of market area. And those really started taking off and going through the downtown. Uh, David mentioned the call building you can see on on fire here on the left. It's still standing there. It just had its top cut off and it got like a 1950s uh, cladding put over the top of it. But this was sort of like the Salesforce tower of the time. This is a the major skyscraper of the era um, and it's just yeah. in flames. And I think people started to understand this. You know, they're living in outlying neighborhoods. They start seeing these massive plumes of smoke coming from downtown. So where are we now, David? This is uh, Dolores Park looking, uh, it's a pretty common view if you ever ride the J, J Church streetcar. I mean, it's just looking straight towards the intersection of uh, 18th and Dolores. That's the old Mission High School mm -hmm. on the left. And we love this kid. When we got this photo, I thought, wow, this is the most amazing picture ever. And on the back was handwritten that this was an hour after the earthquake. Um, 
then somebody pointed out, it might have been Ben Zotto, I'm not sure. Somebody <laughs> pointed out that the Bancroft Library had another copy. I thought this was our copy. And it turns out that this was a, a photo that was that was widely sold. Mm -hmm. And uh copy. I mean, with good reason, it's an amazing picture. Yeah. Uh, might have a later one from this spot. So remember this view. Remember yeah. all those houses on the other side of Dolores. Right. So we're gonna we're gonna look at the evolution of what happened after the earthquake and fire. From we're gonna look at Dolores Park a lot. And I also because I did this show last month in the Richmond district at the Four Star, we're gonna look at some Richmond district things a lot too. But that's Mission High School. The fires started south of Market. It's really starting to engulf it. And people start getting the idea. I think about mid morning maybe we should start moving. Um, we don't know how big this fire is gonna get and we don't know how far it's going to go. Um, so this is on Mission Street, uh, refugees are just piling things up. They're starting to figure out what they should carry with them if they need to leave. Uh, and it was a good idea. The fires just kept growing and another fire started uh, in today's Hayes Valley um, and started moving to the east. So you have, large fires converging on each other, uh, going towards the Mission District. Um, this is from Lafayette Park, and you see the, the growth of the fires. Um, there's another shot, how much smoke is filling the sky, and everybody is just starting to wonder, will this be stopped? Right. Where's this view from, David? Uh, this is from Potrero Hill. Uh, I think it's like 18th in Carolina. We're looking down towards what would be Jackson Playground which is kind of all filled there, Mission Creek, there's water down there, but you can see the smoke on the left from, from that Hayes Valley fire, and then uh, on the right from the downtown fires. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, that's actually 20th Street, you know, I, I put a little oh, yeah, there. 20th, yeah. That house down. is still there on 20th Street, actually. Um, so this is, a, you know, this just keeps growing. Here's a couple of shots from Corona Heights above the Castro, you can see, and I just put one, 24 Beaver Street is still there, just to give you some idea. And then if we kind of move a little to the side on Corona Heights, this is how big this, the fire is getting. Um, you know, it's you read the accounts of this fire and it is just, it is terrifying. You know, it's like it's taking over south of market. There were a lot of uh, uh, working class people who lived south of market at the time. They were burned out quickly. Um, they started moving people who were injured from the quake uh, to the Civic Center. And then when that fire started in Hayes Valley, called the Ham and Eggs Fire, because it apparently started when a woman tried to start cooking breakfast and the fire, the flu was damaged, started the fire there. Uh, suddenly they realized we've got to get these injured people out of the Civic Center because there's a fire coming now from the other side. There's a pretty famous picture of of people gathered in Union, I mean, in uh, yeah, Union Square, uh, with all their belongings and stuff, and and fire raging. Little did they know that they would end up being right in the middle of everything that burned. Yeah, and I just want to point out that kind of in the lower part of this photo on the left, you can see there's some people who have already escaped, and they're kind of camping out down there on the lower part of the left of this photo. Um, but you know it was just gonna grow. So fire destroys much of the city, uh, much of the built part of the city. And in the end, it was an incredible disaster. Uh, 4.7 square miles, 500 blocks, 28,000 buildings all burned. Um, and again, we're talking about more than 200,000 people who are suddenly like, have no place to live, at least temporarily. What, Go ahead. What was, what was the population of San Francisco at that time? It was somewhere, it was about 400 and something, I believe is what they have told me. So it's almost half of the city um, population wise. This is a little map showing you the sort of the path of the fires um, south of the slot, the south of market areas where the fires mostly started, started burning through uh, up Market Street. And then you can see on the left, the ham and eggs fire started coming to the east. And uh, we've talked about this. It's often mentioned uh, about the fires is that that fire was going southwest and it was going to just tear through the mission. Um, and it was only really stopped right at Dolores Park, today's Dolores Park. And so it's a good place to kind of center ourselves about what we do after the fire's over and what do we do with all the displaced people.
I think the big tragedy here, David, is I always think of that third day, which is up in the northeast part of the city, right. where you kind of feel like they almost stopped this fire and then it just got away from them and took out, you know, North Beach. Um, North Beach still... and around Telegraph Hill, yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is what you face, right? This is what the, the landscape of the city looks like from south of Market after the fires, after the earthquake. Um, and there are... Uh, city leaders, a lot of people were wondering, is San Francisco done in a sense? Is it not going to be the preeminent, the preeminent West Coast city? Um, is something like Portland or Los Angeles going to you know, take its place? This is a view towards Telegraph Hill, just to show you what the landscape looked like. This is uh, St. Francis CC Church, is still church there at 610 Vallejo Street. Um, but, you know, people lived all through Nor uh, North Beach and South of Market. Um, it was a lot of the poorer people in San Francisco who didn't have resources to rebuild. They were renting um, and they didn't have jobs suddenly because their place of business had been destroyed. Uh, and just to give you a sort of personal uh, take on this, I guess, is this is my great, great grandmother, Ruth Neat. And she goes back to where her and her husband and three or four of her children and uh, a couple rumors all lived in this one building and it was destroyed in the earthquake and fire. And she went back to visit it um, just to show you, you know, they're all like suddenly homeless and they don't have anything, any place to go. So David, I love this picture. Can you describe a little about, bit about what we're seeing here, um, what we're looking at? So we're, we're looking kind of uh, Southwest from, I guess from like Steiner Street, this is Hamilton Square, which is what it says there, Hamilton Square, still a park on Geary. Geary is running uh, in the background on the left. That large building there is Girls High School. Uh, there's now that I think there's still a big high school there, Newcomer High School, maybe, I don't know, I'm not sure of the name. But what we kind of analyzing this picture, we decided it was awfully early in the process i don't think the fire is still going at this point but you know the ad hoc uh, uh structures and lean-tos and tents and things were what people built for themselves these guys just look totally shell-shocked out there having taken whatever they could of value a sewing machine you know steamer trunk some mattresses and they're wiped out yeah but yeah the ladies I, still have their hats on yeah of course <laughs> <laughs> i you know these photos and we got to zoom in on it really and you do get this feeling of, of people just suffering from ptsd almost you know or just don't know what's going to happen next the woman on the far left here you know she's just staring into space and this guy with the broom on the right sweeping, sweeping. up the grass you know you just feel like uh, how much of a disaster this must have seemed to so many people. And it was. Um, nowadays, you know, we go celebrate the anniversary in a sense. We go to Lotus Fountain early in the morning and we dress up in old costumes and we sing San Francisco and it's all kind of like about the recovery. But initially, this is what the recovery looked like. It was, it was a disaster and people were in trouble and needed help. So this is a good photo to give you an idea of what it was like to be a refugee right after the disaster. We're on Mint Hill and we're looking um, towards Knob Hill. You can kind of see in the distance, this is the Fairmont Hotel. This is a Protestant orphanage on Haight Street at the time. And there's City Hall, which you could see was very much destroyed by the earthquake and then the fire after. And that, that yeah. the dome of City Hall was kind of a, uh kind of where the library is today, sort yeah. of. Yeah, it was a little, not exactly where City Hall is today. Right. And then you can see, like, people are just using tents. They're camped out here along uh, DeBose and Martin, uh, Martin Laguna. Um, it's just amazing. I just think about these people in these houses and how lucky they must have felt because you can see the fire ran right up Market Street on the south side of Market Street. And you got lean twos, and you've got people using boards and corrugated. Tearing metal. down that, tearing down the fence on the left there with the advertising to build their little mm -hmm. lean twos. Yeah, over here, the gardener. And uh, we're just going to keep looking to the right here. 
And you can see what it looks like in the beginning of the Mission District and south of Market. It's just been, it looks like it's been bombed out. There's nothing left, just ashes and some rubble and some chimneys. Keep looking to the right. This is the Bow Street today. And again, these houses, it's just amazing they survived. They just barely missed getting taken out. And then that's Dolores Street. And uh, and you can see there's some tents. The army tents have already kind of uh, been put out there in Dolores Park. Um, but at first, it's like you're on your own. You know, these people here, they've kind of built their shanties. If they had a tent, they used it. The army does come to the fore and they start providing tents. Um, and relief donations start pouring in. So Congress allocates 2.5 million donations come from countries and people all over the world. And the, the question became in San Francisco, all this money came in and they're to help with the recovery. And then it's like, what do we do with this? How do we use this money to get San Francisco back and how to help all these people? And in the aftermath of the disaster, there was uh, a lot of revelations and investigation into the corruption in San Francisco city government that had gone on for quite a while. So there was a lot of people didn't really want to give the city government all this money with this graft trials and this corruption um, investigations going on. So they, they kind of had to come up with another way to distribute the money and to help these folks. This is uh, Mission High School, David. And I think you pointed out some interesting things in this photo of everybody lining up for food and blankets. Right, they're getting supplies. They're, uh, they're, they're, they're just waiting. I mean, I personally, I hate waiting in line, but they had no choice. <laughs> One thing the, that's amazing that what he's pointing out is the, it's kind of the makeshift message board in chalk on the walls of, of uh, Mission High School, people uh, relayed messages to their loved ones, their family that had been separated, saying where we were and and uh, that they were okay and where to find where to find your family. Yeah. So at first, the army's helping with this, and there's other sort of relief things that are put together. But um, initially, like if you lost your house, you might have the resources to move to the East Bay, to go to relatives, to start rebuilding and even camp out on your own property. But so you take those 200,000, many of them just leave. And now you're left, there was the estimate by June, two months after the earthquake, essentially a month and a half, there was still at least 40,000 people who were in the city and had no place to live. Um, you could see this is a relief uh, operation handing out supplies on uh, 25th Street in Guerrero. Um, some of these buildings actually are still there on Guerrero Street. Uh, and if you look down on the lower left, you can see some people just sitting there with, you know, it looks like it was a scene you might see today. They really have nothing and they're just sitting there among garbage and among whatever they can carry with them. It's right. still a major problem as the summer comes in San Francisco. So let's go over how they decided to handle these refugees. So First, they decide they're going to form a corporation using Red Cross as kind of a, the, the base of it so that it gets out of the city government's direct hands. And they start essentially assigning people to volunteer, businessmen, bankers, people like that to help be part of the relief corporation and address the crisis. This is where the fire happens. You can see it takes out a big chunk of settled San Francisco. Most of the west side and the south was even though you see the map here, it was mostly undeveloped. Yeah, I mean, some of, a lot yeah. of these, a lot of this grid is is uh, hypothetical, right? There weren't, there weren't, uh, there wasn't a huge grid in the sunset. The uh, Hunter's Point is not a big grid like that. These are undeveloped areas. It's not like this. Uh, this it was, it's not as though those places survived the earthquake. There was yeah. nobody living. Yeah, and it's actually interesting, the circles with the numbers in it, they they basically split the city up into zones to figure out relief efforts. And those in those circles are the numbers of people that they're basically serving in those relief zones. So you can see like, even though this is a giant section of the city, it's 14,000, there's 12,000 just up in this section and 10,000 in all of the Richmond. So that's the way it worked. And at first they have 21 permanent camps is what they called them, where relief uh, refugees could come for relief. And these were mostly set up in city parks. 
Um, so let's look at one real quick, relatively soon after the earthquake. This is Camp 5 in Golden Gate Park. So you can see this is on the big recreation field, the baseball field in Golden Gate Park. Uh, Mount Sutro is in the background on the right. And this is when the army basically comes in and they bring in tents and they're basically housing people, setting up stoves, and it's very rudimentary. Um, this is not going to be something they want to have in this in this particular formation, in this shape, when the winter comes and it starts to rain, because they're basically tents on dirt. Right. 3,000 people in Camp 5. You know, this is where you see these photos and the resilience of San Franciscans and they start naming their little tents. Like this is Camp Cheerful with Mrs. R. Lucas. Um, but summer comes, they say, okay, let's at least put some wooden floors on the bottom of these tents. So it's not so much of a quagmire in July and August. <clears throat> let's look at Camp 19. This is in Dubos Park today. And, and then, um, and you can see they have tents now, 650 people here. The kids are lined up in the front. Um, they basically just used every little park they could, not every park, but most of the parks that they had in the city as the temporary homes for the refugees. Um, very quickly, they were like, this is not sustainable. Um, there's no bathrooms. They kind of set up their little relief station, stations and bathrooms. Uh, the kitchens, the cooking, they're worried there's going to be more fires, there's, they're worried about disease. So they're trying to come up with a better plan to house all the folks. And then remember, let's look at Camp 18. There's still lots of people who are kind of outside of the system. So here we're looking back at Dolores Park again. Um, you see here are the army tents, but then there's people who are still like just creating their own shanty or camping out on their own along 18th Street um, here in Dolores. So, and then there's people who are just like camping rough, you might say in the park that are actually outside of the system. They're not in the official camps. This is in Golden Gate Park near the Sharon building, as you can see in children's playground. So they thought there was like 10 to 15,000 of these people as late as September who were just camping in the parks or camping on a site and really had no direct relief from the corporation. So the army just distributed these. The first thing they did was they distributed these tents in some of the regular camps. They they set them up into some organization, right? But it looks yeah. like people just got tents and were said, yeah, put them up and, and, and uh, take care of yourself. Pretty right. And, and the thing you also should remember is the relief camps, the refugee camps were were kind of run by the military. They were run on a very military basis. So there are a lot of people who are sort of outside of society in a lot of ways, and we're not going to put up with that. And they were basically just like you might think of today, a lot of unhoused people just camping where they wanted to. All right. <clears throat> so here's the plan. It's going to rain. The tents are not a long term solution. Obviously, they still thousands of people to house. So the Relief Corporation comes up with a very innovative plan. They say, first of all, we have to build real houses for these folks so that when it rains, they're actually housed correctly. Second of all, we can put union carpenters and all these people, these laborers who need work in the aftermath to work. So these are union carpenters here who are helping to build these cottages. Um, and third, because they're worried about giving somebody something for nothing. They're worried about creeping socialism. They decide there's going to be sort of a rent to own plan with these. The refugees pay a quasi rent. It's not officially rent, but they pay something to the corporation to live in one of these cottages. Then when the camps close, the refugees can take the cottage with them to some undeveloped lot they can buy for cheap somewhere and use them as a starter home. And the idea was that this was a way that we could keep the workforce in San Francisco, so San Francisco does not lose its preeminence, put people to work and house this labor force in the city. And the plan so, was yeah. to be temporary, right? I mean, it's, a, it's like, we're in the park for a little while and then you're gonna move out until we're back on our feet. That's right. And just this, the picture we're looking at, this is Park Presidio Boulevard today. Um, it was basically parkland uh, in the Richmond district. 
And so this is one of the largest camps and they're building these little cottages. Uh, 5,610 of these cottages were constructed. They housed at the height, more than 16,000 people. And remember I said, 15,000 to build a little cottage today or $100,000 to build a little cottage. These each cost $157 when they did all the, the math, which is a little over $5,600 today in today's dollars. So they had a pretty good deal actually. All right, let's go back to Dolores Park. Remember, we got tents, army tents. We got shanties down here. This is in the summer by November. That's what it looks like. Wow. Little earthquake cottages. All lined up. And so we see the, so that's the little, that's the wall there for Mission High School, which is just out of frame to the right. Right. So Here it is. Uh, and then there it is. Yeah. And uh, you can see, we'll, we'll kind of look closer at them, but these all have the basics that people needed to get back on their feet and to make sure that they were well taken care of. I think of them as the three S's. This is looking the other direction. They had a stove so they could cook and keep warm. Uh, the camps offered services. So they had like schools for the kids. They had sewing classes for people to learn vocations, um, just anything that they thought healthcare essentially for the refugees. And they had sanitation because they were very worried of course about disease. <clears throat> so this was a way um, to kind of help stem that. And look at all the little stove pipes sticking up, David. I think those are yeah. pretty funny. They had little like Franklin stoves in each one. I feel like not all the camps, not every cottage in every camp had a stove. Was it an extra charge for the stove? Or Yeah, you were technically supposed to pay an extra $2 uh, a month for the stove. <laughs> I don't know if they you know, enforced that that much. It's funny, I've looked at these pictures many, many times. And that's one detail in that Dolores Park picture that I hadn't really noticed that every place seems to have a stovepipe. Where yeah, well, here, you go here the next one. Yeah, they don't have, everybody. everyone doesn't have one here. This is, we're looking in Park Presidio Boulevard again, looking toward north, towards the Presidio. And this was one of the largest camps. They had a lot of room, uh, more than 4,000 people uh, it's almost camp. the same view as the construction shot that we saw earlier. Right. A little farther away. Here, this will kind of help. This is 1150, 1156 Clement Street. Um, so Gary is just closer to us. And that building is still standing today, by the way. <laughs> um, so Gary would be right here. Bonanza. Yeah. So this camp opened, most of them opened in November. They really started construction in September. By two months later, most of these uh, cottage camps opened. And these colored postcards are good, David, because they kind of show you something you don't see in black and white, which was what you might call the color scheme of the right. earthquake shacks. Right, so they because they were in the parks, they wanted them to be natural. So <laughs> they in. decided to uh, paint them this park bench green, which is what they, I guess, what they painted the park benches too. So they had the that green paint. And I want to say that uh, when we get to identifying earthquake shacks uh, extant in the city today, that park bench green is a really important detail. Yeah, it is. So this is sort of life in the camps, you know, people hanging their laundry. Uh, they, they're sort of making the best of it. They called these little streets by sort of satirical names like Market Street. And uh, and a lot of the businesses that were around these camps actually did pretty well because the refugees actually continued to buy groceries or drinks when the bars opened. This is Portsmouth Square, uh, shacks in Portsmouth Square in Chinatown. And like David said, they're green painted. They have redwood walls, cedar shingled roofs. The floors were made of fur, used, they used fur, and they come in three general sizes. We've seen a lot of variation in this, but essentially the smallest were about 10 feet by 14 feet. Um, then there's 14 by 18. And then there were some type C is what Jane Cryan called them, 18 by 24. So three, three sort of sizes for the size of the family. Uh, here's another camp, just to show you kind of a before and after. This is uh, Lobo Square. It's where Moscone Field, oh, 
yeah, it's called Moscone Field today. I'm still going by what I grew up with. Um, and you see all the army tents are set up. We're looking towards a, a gas uh, installation there, looking kind of northeast. And then Fort Mason in the background. Yeah, Fort Mason there. And then this is what it looked like in the shacks were built. And this was one of the largest camps. Uh, and it was the last to close. And it had uh, more than almost 5,000 people at the height uh, who lived in the Marina District at Lobo Square. And this is, I mean, they're all over town. And, the, and remember, a lot of these people, most people living in these are working class people that they're trying to keep in the city. So there was a major camp uh, near the Union Ironworks. Um, so this, I love this camp because it's on the hill and you see the the sort of struts and how they're just like, it's amazing what they did, how they built these things on stilts essentially to be uh, up on the top of Potrero Hill. Uh, Get them graded up, yeah. Yeah. Here's Franklin Square uh, over in the sort of mission area. I have they're a question city. about yeah. the populations of the different camps. Where are the, where are the camps? Um, yeah. Were they were they segregated by family? Uh, like like uh, I think John Freeman had said that certain camps had families with kids. We see kids in a lot of these pictures, and certain camps did not have kids or did not have family structures or just individuals. Well, that... again, they the people had to apply to essentially get into a camp, and so there was some self segregation. There was also because we're in a extremely racist time in our history, uh, they segregated by race. I mean, Lobo Square had most of the people of color. Uh, Chinese were sent um, all the way to the west side of town when uh, the quake first happened. So Lobo Square basically was like uh, a very diverse camp, whereas others would be very segregated um, by race. So, and as far as families, it seemed to mostly depend on what neighborhood they originally came from, where they worked, and that's mm. what they would apply and how big the cabins were. So a camp that would have larger cabins might have more families. People would get reassigned too. If they were kind of, if they needed more people in the Camp Richmond, they would send them from Franklin Square. Huh. All right. But remember, this is, it's just like COVID, you know, they're like the emergency is over <laughs> one year after the earthquake, a little more. And the park commission basically says, okay, you built these, uh, less than a year after these cottages are built, they want the parks cleared. They say we want now we want them to take their cottages and to go away, and we want our parks back. Um, quickly, this actually happens uh, throughout August and September and October. Uh, cottages start being pulled out of the camps, um, and this is a newspaper article to show the enrichment of the refugees. How they could take one of these cottages, move them to a property in the outlying areas of the city where there was lots of open land and a lot could be bought for a hundred bucks and basically having their first home, a starter home. They shingle it, they might add to it and, uh, and now they're set up as homeowners. Let's talk a little bit about the moving, David. Uh, of the 5,600 or so built, more than 5,300 were moved. They recorded it. And you basically paid like 12 bucks to, um, for to move one cottage. And you you hired a, a tr basically a team of horses, a guy with a wagon, and they would just put it up on a wagon and move your cottage out of the camp. And the you know, rent is supposed to be refunded at this point, by the way. It's just a little empty box. They're not that heavy. <laughs> it's still crazy to me that they carted these things on horse with horses all over the city right for cedar park uh just below bernal heights <clears throat> and this is kind of how they did it they basically threw some boards up so it wouldn't shift too much took off the stovepipe, and uh they carted you to wherever you wanted the house moved and again originally the idea was these refugees were supposed to take their own cottage and be self-sufficient and go form their own little homestead. But a lot of property, real estate people, by the end, when they were just trying to rush to clear the parks, grabbed dozens of them and created little tenement communities. This is over in Daly City, just across the border. 
Um, and you can see a bunch of shacks were moved there and uh, basically people are renting them out. This is kind of on the hill above the Daly City BART station. Yeah. Here's another community called Villa Maria, where the landlord basically bought a bunch of shacks, put them on a, a wooden deck and rented them out. And the Relief Corporation didn't want this. They wanted to get these people out of tenements. They wanted to get them out of that sort of uh, renting lifestyle. But, you know, in trying to clear the parks, these things did happen. That's almost, to me, that's almost the most innovative aspect of it, that you take these people who uh, were renters and marginalized uh, people living downtown and give and you know and and give them a pretty cheap house and something that they could call their own. Yeah, and some of them were pretty. I mean, pretty nice little rentals. This is back to the Richmond district. Park Presidio is on the right, and that's where the big camp was. And on the left here, about five years after the earthquake, you see these little cottages got kind of done up. Uh, you know, usually what would happen is they'd move the earthquake shacks, they'd put some shingles up, and maybe add a a bathroom, of course, because they didn't have bathrooms. But these guys added little bay windows and lined them up there on 14th Avenue. Um, this is kind of what the setup normally looked like. You take one or two shacks, usually two, you kind of make a T, connect them together, put a bathroom in, uh, maybe an addition on the back, shingled them over. Um, and I, we even talked, I even talked to a 103 year old woman uh, a few years back and she talked about how quickly her, I think it was her father shingled the house because he wanted to escape the shame of seeming to have an earthquake refugee cottage. So it was part of the, the thing. We're not poor. We, we shingle this over. It's our own little house. And you see earthquake shacks through photos for the next 20, 30 years in historical photos, right, David? Yeah, absolutely. So this is Castro Street. Oh, that's 26th and Castro at the left. But those buildings are still there on the left. And then up Castro between 26th and, what is it? Is it Cesar Chavez now? That, that's next after 26th, I think. Those five little earthquake cottages lined up. And that looks like one that, you know, maybe somebody owned and rented those out. Because yeah, those I think are, so. I think they rented out a little. One lot. Mm -hmm. one lot on the thing and then i i wrote a story about this a couple of weeks ago i think david could put it on the chat the link but you know this is there were some people like mother minerva was her name and she's all the way down in colma she had three shacks that were put together and they basically looked exactly like they were in the camps for years after decades after really <laughs> um and i've heard of earthquake shacks moving as far as santa cruz in the aftermath so here we are, we're just uh, west of Dolores Park now, we go back to Dolores Park. And uh, this is a good five or six, maybe 10 years after the earthquake. And they're doing street improvements to Cumberland, um, going up to Sanchez Street. And if you look up there on the hill, there's two little earthquake shacks that got shingled and put together and made a residence. And if you went there today, you'd see though they're still there. Yeah. And I think that's what, you know, Dave, we're going to talk about tonight is that not only were these, uh, this plan successful in getting these people housed for a year in the parks, but it, they were successful in resettling the city for many, many people. And it just shows that they're still here today, how successful they were. Yeah. So for decades, it kind of faded from, I think, people's minds. And then in the 80s, uh, earthquake shacks sort of came back into public consciousness thanks to Jane Cryan, who is here with me underneath a, a house we were trying to investigate. Um, she lived in the little house here on the right at 24th Avenue in the sunset, and she discovered they were three earthquake cottages that had been put together. And she really raised the profile of them and, and tried to get them saved wherever she could find them that if they were going to be demolished. Uh, she got the, this little complex turned into a city landmark, um, and she was she was basically the the main first advocate for earthquake cottages. Well, what was the name of the organization that she founded? Which yeah, I was, was trying, I think just pretty much just her, right? It is pretty much her, and it was called the Society for the Appreciation and Preservation of 1906 San Francisco Earthquake Relief Cottages. That's a mouthful. 
I think that was the name. <laughs> Um, so she, she goes around, she becomes the, a shacktivist, um, we might call her. And this was a, another triumph of hers. This was right behind um, the restaurant at 34th and Gary that you might know, Pacific Cafe. There were a couple of earthquake cottages and they were to be demolished for a new, prop, a new development. And she fought to get them saved. Um, she succeeded. They were moved to the Presidio and restored to look like they were in the camps and uh, used as an educational installation. Um, they're still there today. They're called the Goldie Shacks. A little side note, they never did develop that lot, by the way, behind Pacific Cafe. So it was a lot of work for an empty lot. And then David, what happened in well, about 2002? 2002, Jane Cryan had kind of retired from shacktivism and uh, and and they they found a couple of other suckers <laughs> to <laughs> to take over that we, sort of thing. Yeah, we were told these houses, these two houses, which actually were four earthquake shacks, um, were going to be torn down, demolished in the outer Sunset District. And uh, we worked with the owners because we decided that David and I, we said that Western Neighborhoods Project should save these. So. We got into a long four-year plan to uh, get these off the lot so the owner could build on it. Uh, we stripped the shingles off. You see the asbestos shingles. And lo and behold, there's your green park bench green paint on the redwood walls. Right. I remember when we when we first tore, we don't I have a picture of it uh, on my Twitter, but when but uh, we don't have one here, but when we first kind of dug through the outer wall of the of the shack and, and there were like four layers there was a layer uh, excuse me for saying so there's a layer of asbestos siding uh -oh. and then tar paper and then the shingles which were common uh as the first covering and yeah. then we got down to the green wood and we knew we for sure had a couple of earthquake shacks yeah and we recruited a lot of people who helped us. Uh, Sheedy Crane came out and uh, we, we had a hard time finding a home. It took quite a while. And then we got them moved to the zoo, the back lot of the zoo, uh, which came through and let us move them there to work on them. And we recruited volunteers to help. And we got one completely restored to look like it was in the camps. And we moved it down to Market Street. Um, so that we could display it for the hundredth anniversary of the 1906 earthquake. So and we had camera date was incorrect in this particular. Uh, <laughs> you remember that? It was so funny when you'd have that date there. Anyway, so we had some little signs. We drew more than 15,000 people came to visit the earthquake shack on Market Street in April 2006. So that was a lot of fun. I'll but then tell maybe... you, I'll tell you that the earthquake shack almost. Oh, got a new resident because that April of 2006, I pretty much lived in that shack <laughs> every day, opening it and closing it for like Poor five David. weeks. I didn't Poor spend David. the night. But... Poor David. Anyway, we got it moved to the zoo. It's it's actually in the zoo in what they call Conservation Corner. Um, so you can go visit it there in the zoo. It needs a paint job. It needs more work because it's been What's... sitting out in the weather for 15 years now, but what's interesting to me here in this picture shows uh, the dark green is the original paint from 1906, uh, which is not available because of toxic uh, yeah. contents. So the the lighter fading green is the paint that we got to simulate the 1906 paint. And the 1906 paint still looks pretty okay it's so toxic it holds up yeah it's true <laughs> and because i did this talk last month in the richmond i just pointed out some that are still standing today in the richmond district so this is on clement street you can you know we're going to go through this right now about how to spot a, a former earthquake shack but you can tell it pretty much is a a former earthquake cottage bernal heights has tons of them i think because they had small lots that were available for pretty cheap and they were right next to an earthquake shack camp so a lot of little houses moved up to Bernal Heights and the shacks pretty much fit the lots and they never got torn down 
So here's one of the middle-sized ones, a type B um, on Bocana Street. Uh, here, here we are back in Potrero Hill, a, another type B. And again, you're trying to get the feeling, right? This shingle, shingling definitely gives you that feeling. And these are a couple of my favorites. Uh, this is me talking with uh, Jackie, who used to own them on Carver Street on the east side of the hill. And if you're up on top of Bernal Hill, you look down, you can totally see these two with the little adjoining middle part. Um, they're very clearly earthquake shacks. So it's kind of nice if you're trying to look for them in the wild. Um, these are pretty visible. Right. That picture of you and Jane was actually underneath. Oh, we were under Carver. this one? Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, that other one. We crawled underneath the house there to see what it looked like. Ah, cool. All right. Now we're going to give you your lesson on how to identify an earthquake shack or cottage. First of all, look at the roof pitch. This is what I always look at first. Um, it's a pretty shallow kind of like a pup tent uh, angle or pitch. If you see, like you see the one on the right, there's this pitch sticking up and you're thinking, oh, there's an earthquake shack back there. But that's too steep. Um, and, it, and again, it's got to be this gable roof, not like a four part roof. So look for the roof pitch first. Second, shacks often travel in packs. <laughs> they usually <laughs> took one or two, I mean, two or three together and combined them. So this one on Moultrie, which uh, you can see is like one in the front, one in the back, just connected. And here's a little bathroom that sticks out. So look for that sort of combination, like a modular look. Here's another example. You see this from the BART. I mean, I often see it when I'm writing BART. It's over uh, kind of in the ocean view area, like three all lined up there. And I there's think David, it's a, a very it's young actually, man. It's actually only two. We Is it two? Checked in, uh, we okay. checked in the, the aerial views. It's two. And I, I went back to, I went back last month to take another picture of these because I know that these got rehabbed afterwards. And I found that about a year ago, there was a fire uh, that burned those shacks. They're still there. I don't know. They'll have to be re rehabbed again. There I am, by the yeah, way. You look pretty young, David. Uh, the other thing still is about some hair. size. You know, people often say, I think this is an earthquake shack. And usually if it's pretty big, it's not. They, they're pretty small. You have So this is one of the shacks we saved when it was in its better days. And it's it's a tiny little place. And this one, like somebody said, oh, I think this is one on Ellsworth. And it's just too large. If you see a large gabled building, it probably isn't an earthquake shack. And there's little details to look for. If you see one of these six light windows, which is pretty rare, um, that's what the shacks had. So sometimes they survive. Um, often you get these exposed rafter ends that are still visible. They, they don't get covered up, but there's no addition. Also very shacky. <laughs> and then this is what Dave was talking about, that kind of clinchers. If you dig in the wall and you find that green paint, or if you can get on the inside, you might find wallpaper using 1906 or 1907 newspapers. Um, and we've yeah. seen this in a number of places, actually. Right. Get the wind out. Yeah, I mean, so the, 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 these things were built to be temporary. And one of the first things we heard and read about was that people would uh, try to insulate them. And the easiest way to do it was with newspaper, whatever they had to, you know, shore them up. Yeah, or burlap or something like that. Yeah. All right, let's see if you, we're going to test you guys and see if you can spot an earthquake shack in the wild now after all you've learned. Here's 150 Montcalm. Is this an earthquake shack? No. <laughs> Why not, David? Well, it does it, it has that uh, peaked roof, that hipped roof. That, that's a hipped roof. And it's that, big. It's really it is, big. It is pretty big. It's small for a house, big for a shack. But mainly, yeah. How about 48 Cortland? It's got the shingles. It's got the right pitch of the roof. It looks pretty small. Ding, ding, ding. Yes. It's a pretty big shack, but it, we have concluded it is one. And I think somebody did a little more research and did find it. They put those little bays, you can see, bay windows in the front. Those are added, but added the, on. the core is the same. How about this one? 131 Ellert Street. 
I want it to be one, but it's too steep. Yep. Let's go back here. You see how the pitch is kind of shallow? And then this one is a little too steep. Okay. 673 Moultrie. All these are I believe, I believe that is one. You're right, David. It looks <laughs> really good. Um, but again, they kind of change things up. They might change the windows, the doorways, but you kind of look at the core of it. Um, and it is a shack. This one looked like it got hacked off somehow. But I don't know why this one is in here, but that is way too big. Yeah. So. I remember that guy called us and we came out and looked at it and we're like, no. Sorry. Didn't That's even a real have to, Somebody didn't have to do anything. Yeah. 223 Broad Street in the Ocean View. I believe. Yes. Shacks travel in packs. I think this might be two of them. But yeah. Oh, how about this one? 230 Montcalm. This is a tough one. I think this is not one. I'm not I, sure. I kind of I need I need more investigation. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, I saw I saw this presentation, but I did not remember <laughs> what the answer was on this one. I guess what I'm gonna say is sometimes you don't know. It it takes more investigation. It's got this bay, but it might have been added. It's got this roof that seems kind of wrong, but it's the right pitch and it's a good size. So we don't know sometimes. And I'm gonna show you how I get fooled myself. I looked at this backyard shed somebody had on 21st Avenue in the Richmond. And I walked in the backyard and I'm like, that just looks like a backyard shed. It's probably not a shack. And I got closer and what do I see? They ripped off the side, green, the green, wood. green paint. Yeah. Green wood. So it is, it's just a heavily modified earthquake cottage. It's just been, it had a different siding on it. And here's another one that would fool you. You walk up to this, David, you're like, that is way too big. No way, but it is. And let's go back in time. This is what it looked like. It was two shacks that were put together and then they raised them up to put a first story on. Here's, you can see the exposed rafter tails we talked about. Here's yeah. where they separate. And they basically just built it up and covered it up. I think they took a lot of the personality out of it when they oh, did that. Oh, I loved it when it was looked like this, but yeah, uh, looks like a little gingerbread house. And then there's yeah. that building next to it now, right? Yes. So now you can see that giant building on the right. Yeah. All right. And anyway, they're still out there, and I think you're going to find them. Like this is a great example. If you go to Bernal on Bronte Street and you see that little house, that looks totally like one. You get closer. Um, and this is why we lose earthquake cottages and why there's few of them out and why we're always trying to identify them and save them is this recently sold this little 480 square foot house. How much did it sell for in April 2022? A lot of money. I mean, not a lot of San Francisco money, but for a beat up old little house, that's a lot of money. Um, and what I love about them is when they're kind of beat up is you can often see the get right down to the core of their their original look. So here's the terrible roof of 45 Bronte. And if you get closer, you can actually see the original cedar shingle roof underneath all these later um, yeah. coverings. And then again, like I said, it never ends. Um, David might put this in the chat, but there's currently a battle for this one, uh, 369 Valley Street. Um, and it keeps going. The hearings keep getting delayed and postponed, but essentially the owner keeps trying to get around uh, preserving this very intact earthquake shack in Noe Valley and trying to build by under it, moving it, going on top of it. Um, so its future is still yet to be determined. And then even the ones that are saved don't stay saved. These are the Goldie Shacks that Jane saved in the Presidio. And they're getting kind of beat up. And the Presidio Trust and the National Park Service are kind of playing, I don't know, hot potato with them. They don't really know what to do with them. They don't really want to take care of them or interpret them. So we don't know what the future of the Goldie Shacks is going to be. Um, and they need a paint job too. And then before we get to questions, I just want to dedicate this show to my great grandparents, Milton and Ethel. I wrote a column about them that I uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and 
they met in an earthquake refugee camp uh, after the 1906 earthquake and fire, and they met there, fell in love, and got married that November. So if it wasn't for this horrible disaster and earthquake refugee camps, uh, well, I wouldn't be doing this talk. We would never have saved the, the Kirkham shacks. And by That's, the way, I want to say about the Kirkham shacks, the one that we restored is is at the zoo, as Woody mentioned, but two others, one, two others were restored and are in Oakland near Jack London Square. Yeah. Now, what's it called? The Fifth Street Institute? That's right. Something. And then David might want to, I don't know what, if we had questions in the chat, but I think David might have shared some links he did. And also, I just want to say, you know, if you're a friend of Woody, um, you could have attended this for free. And if you are a friend of Woody and you didn't attend for free, let me know and I'll refund your money. Um, but I just, you know, David will put in the link, um, become a friend of Woody at San Francisco Story. And if you are a friend and you think this was so great, you just want to tip us, you can do that too. There's a donate link to uh, to tip us. Um, Here's, a handy. Here's a handy link in the chat. Oh, that's awesome. But thank you all for coming. And we're happy to take questions. And I think we could have people turn on their cameras if they